Hello everyone, this is the RX Daily Dose. This episode is being recorded on Friday, September 20th, and I'm your host, Ian Parnagoni. Thanks all for tuning in today. I've seen a lot of growth with the podcast through social media and on our streaming platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. We're also on YouTube with the episodes every week. You can get all the links and subscribe through our website, which I'll post in the show notes at the end. Let's get right into it and start today with updates from the FDA. Late last week, the FDA expanded the indication for mepolizumab, that's brand name Nucala, to include children as young as six years old with severe eosinophilic asthma. Nucala is a subcutaneous injection that was first approved in the United States in 2015 as an add-on maintenance treatment for patients with severe asthma who were aged 12 years or older and who had an eosinophilic phenotype. Eosinophilic asthma is a rare condition, and patients typically are started on more conventional therapy for asthma, such as oral but most likely inhaled corticosteroids, fast-acting inhalers, and leukotriene modifiers. But once the diagnosis falls into the eosinophilic category, most providers add on treatments that specifically focus on this kind of asthma. There are three other products on the market right now in the same class. Those are Fasenra, Dupixent, and Syncair. All products are monoclonal antibodies and considered specialty, so they're filled with a specialty pharmacy and most likely have prior authorization in place before approval. Nucala right now is the only one with the added approval for six years and older. All other products are indicated for 12 years and older. The FDA this week also approved Tenapinor, that's brand name Ibsrella, for treatment of irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, or IBS-C, in adults 18 years of age or older. IBS-C is a subcategory of IBS in which patients have symptoms of IBS, which typically include abdominal pain, bloating, and abnormal stool frequency and abnormal stool consistency. But in addition to those symptoms, patients with IBS-C have more common constipation than diarrhea. Most commonly, IBS patients are treated to relieve symptoms by changing diet, adding fiber, increasing fluids, or adding probiotics. For IBS-C specifically, there are a few drug classes and products that help relieve symptoms. All the products affect the colon and basically increase the amount of water movement within the colon. From what I can see, Ibsrella is the first in its class of products from Ardelix. The class is called Sodium Hydrogen Exchanger 3 Inhibitors, that's NHE3, but the company has other products in development as well. Most common side effect with Ibsrella was diarrhea. If severe diarrhea occurs, it should be stopped. The FDA also expanded the indication for apalutamide, that's brand name Erlita. Erlita was approved back in February of 2018 for patients with non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Breaking that down a little, non-metastatic means the cancer is confined to one area, in this case the prostate, and the castration-resistant term comes from how the cancer responds to initial therapy in an attempt to deplete the body of testosterone. When prostate cancer progresses after initial treatment, either surgery or radiation, men may receive medical or surgical treatments that lower testosterone, also referred to as androgen deprivation therapy, acronym is ADT. ADT includes treatments to suppress or block the production or action of hormones called androgens, of which testosterone is the main. While ADT is often effective, in certain patients, prostate cancer adapts and can progress. This is when this class of drugs comes into play. The new indication for Erlita, approved by the FDA, adds metastatic prostate cancer, cancer that has spread beyond the prostate. There are five other products with this indication on the market, so a wealth of competition within this class. On September 17th, the FDA granted accelerated approval for Lenvatinib, that's brand name Lenvima, 
and pembrolizumab, brand name Keytruda, in combination for the treatment of patients with advanced endometrial carcinoma who have disease progression following prior systemic therapy. The indication applies to patients who are not candidates for curative surgery or radiation and who have a specific type of the disease, called microsatellite instability high or mismatch repair deficient. This is part of a larger project by the FDA called Project Orbis, which is an initiative between regulatory bodies in Canada, Australia, and the United States to collaborate on reviews of new products, leading to simultaneous approval in all three countries. And an update on another topic that came up this week, the FDA put out a press release talking about NDMA. It's a known carcinogen that was found in very small amounts in ranitidine. So there's both prescription and over-the-counter ranitidine. It's a very popular product used to treat acid reflux disease, among other things. The FDA states that although NDMA may cause harm in large amounts, the levels the FDA is finding in ranitidine from preliminary tests barely exceeds amounts you might expect to find in common food. The FDA is not calling for individuals to stop taking the medication, however, to talk to your provider about treatment options. To back up on this a little bit, this is not the first time we've seen this. Back in July of 2018, the FDA announced that NDMA had been found in Valsartan, That's a widely used blood pressure medication, and it started overseeing a recall of drugs from three companies. All the generic manufacturers had bought the active ingredient of their Rosartan from one of China's biggest generic companies. The recall has since been expanded 51 times to include two related drugs, that's Herbisartan and Losartan, that was made by at least 10 companies, some since as far back as 2014. In September of 2018, the FDA placed the facility in China on what it calls an import alert, which prohibits the facility from selling anything made there to any company that markets the product in the U.S. Canada soon followed, and as well as the European Union. And just on Wednesday of this week, the maker of Zantac, that's Novartis, as well as as its subsidiary, Sandoz, who makes the generic version, has stopped distribution of the drug. The move is precautionary according to the companies, and this is different than a recall too. A distribution halt means that existing stock of drug in stores and pharmacies can still be sold. So today I wanted to continue talking about flu season. What are the vaccines on the market and who should get a flu vaccine and why it's important? First, there are actually multiple different brand names of vaccine on the market today. Eight, I believe, for this season, and that's from four different manufacturers. They can be broken down into two categories, quadrivalent or trivalent. And like the naming with quad and tri suggest, the quadrivalent vaccine contains coverage for four strains of the flu, and the trivalent vaccine contains coverage for three strains. Now, you might think about that and ask, why would anyone get a vaccine with less coverage? There are two vaccines that are trivalent. First is Fluzone HD, which is indicated for those 65 years and older, and it contains four times the amount of antigen that its standard quadrivalent vaccine. And just so everyone knows about antigen, that's the part of the vaccine that makes the body form antibodies and hence immunity. The whole point of Fluzone HD is to create a stronger immune response. The CDC hasn't placed the recommendation that everyone over 65 get the high-dose vaccine, but it's available. The other trivalent vaccine is Fluod. This is the only adjuvant vaccine on the market. Basically, it means that vaccine is made with components that are meant to elicit a stronger immune response. It's also indicated for 65 and older. Majority of people, however, that go to a pharmacy or their provider's office for a flu vaccine will get the quadrivalent vaccine. There are three vaccines, a fluria, flu zone, and flu laval, that are indicated for everyone six months of age and older. These are the most common you're going to see being prescribed and dispensed from a pharmacy. 
Fluorix is another, but the indication is for three years of age and older. There are two other ones as well, Flublok, which is indicated for 18 years of age and older, and Flucelvax, indicated for four years and older. They're both quadrivalent, but they're recombinant vaccines. That means that the process used to make the vaccine does not require chicken eggs. And this year, there is one live vaccine that's Flumist, which is administered up the nose only for those between 2 and 49 years old. It is the only non-injectable product on the market. The CDC is recommending that everyone, and I'll say it again, everyone age six months of age and older get a flu vaccine this year, especially for those under five and over 65, and those who have other complications or chronic conditions, such as diabetes, asthma, HIV, or an immune disorder. It's important that you get vaccinated not only for you, but for everyone around you. The more people that get immunized, the lower the chance that people around them who do not get immunized are going to get sick. So moral of the story is get your flu shot. Next week, we'll continue our discussion about the flu and talk about some common myths, patient misconceptions, and some interesting stories about flu season. And that's all I have for this week. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I'll include all links and resources in the show notes below, so please go back and check those out too. Please connect with me on any of your social media platforms and give me feedback on what you want to hear about. I'd love to know what you thought about the episode. And as always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe on any of your platforms. And thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. by Joseph McDade.